we really have a mess going on in the world right now. Thanks to COVID, countries all over the world are either just now working to reopen their businesses and restore their economies, or they're still in lockdown, wondering if they will still have an economy left after the pandemic subsides. More of them are looking for more than just an effective treatment or vaccine. They are looking for answers to how this problem became a global pandemic in the first place. Thanks to the level of attention that most people pay to their own political process, the U.S. electorate is currently dividing into camps. Trump, never Trump, is the election over yet, and Jesus, Joe, George Decay took to Twitter to challenge those who won't vote for Biden to discuss their reasons with him. Of course, he decided that he would prevent anyone whom he hadn't named from commenting or even reading the discussion, but he posted the invitation for everyone to see. And it turns out that Obama and Biden knew about the investigations into General Flynn all along. That Biden is on tape in multiple phone calls with then-Ukrainian President Poroshenko, concluding the deal to dismiss the Ukrainian prosecutor in exchange for a billion-dollar loan guarantee, and that Biden has some truly disgusting views on voter loyalty from African Americans. Oh, and Biden's facing a rape allegation, too. Folks are also intensely discussing the highly inflammatory topic of whether governors can extend lockdowns without a set ending date, whether they can prohibit people from going out in public at all, whether they can forbid worship services due to COVID, and even if governors can declare protests illegal. Some are even debating which amendments to the Constitution take precedence, with some arguing that the Tenth Amendment trumps the First Amendment, and vice versa. It's going to be a very... Very interesting episode of Roasted Opinions for me. COVID-19 is a hell of a virus. It poses a significant threat, especially to people with pre-existing conditions and the elderly. The world has enacted, or is enacting, protective measures. Limited social interactions, limited business, safer at home, and even stay-at-home orders have all been used to varying effect. In the U.S., things are just starting to reopen. Most states have begun the process of lifting or reducing restrictions. A few haven't yet, and to be honest, I can't quite understand why. Take Michigan. The Detroit area is still contending with a significant infection rate, but most of the rest of the state is past the worst of the outbreaks. Reopening the safer areas would certainly make sense, but Governor Whitmer seems to think that if one part of Michigan is closed, that all of Michigan has to be closed. In New Jersey, a plan to reopen was finally announced, but with no specific dates listed. They just started to let people go outside, but are keeping many businesses effectively closed. Illinois seems to believe that money grows on trees, which perfectly explains their recent downgrade to near-junk bond status. All three states are at or near the bottom of a list of how each state is weathering the impact of the COVID outbreaks. And all three of these states, strangely enough, are led by Democratic governors. This is an interesting feature of those states who are most affected economically. Mostly, the Democratic governors are presiding over states whose economies are hurting more while seven of the top ten states for weathering the economic impact are led by Republicans. Now there's another detail which bears mentioning. Two of the top five states, including the state weathering the economic impact the best, never issued a stay-at-home order, while the states with the most restrictive orders are having more problems with their economies. Not that it seems to help much. Hertz, the rental car giant, declared bankruptcy. JCPenney is closing still more stores and looks to follow Sears and Kmart into permanent closure. Neiman Marcus has declared bankruptcy. Pier 1 is closed for good. Retail chains are suffering from being declared non-essential businesses and ordered to shut their doors. Papyrus, Lucky's Mart, Earth Fair, Art Van Furniture, Noah's Venues, Models Sporting Goods, Food First Global Restaurants, True Religion, J. Crew, Stage Stores, Garden Fresh Restaurants, and many more smaller businesses are closing for good. Still more retailers are on the verge of collapse. And the longer the reopening of the country takes, the more of these retailers will file for bankruptcy protections. Estimates are approaching 50% of all small businesses that will close forever. Small businesses, remember, constitute over 49% of all jobs in the United States. Ergo, unemployment is expected to persist for a long time, even after the economy reopens. 
That's why so many people are arguing for a more rapid reopening. Our economy is on the verge of a collapse unseen since 1929. One would expect elected officials and candidates to be laser-focused on this issue, especially in the presidential election. But I suppose by now we are all used to disappointment. Each state controls their own COVID response, and there's not much coordination among them. Certainly there isn't between countries. The National Hockey League announced that they plan to have a 2014 playoff when they return to play. Competitive sports returning is good, but perhaps someone should remind the NHL that seven of their teams are in Canada. Canada hasn't announced plans to lift their travel restrictions yet, so those seven teams won't be able to participate until that happens. The presidential election cycle trudges on. Like I said earlier, there's still a lot of people who support Trump's re-election. There's also still a lot of people who would vote for anyone but Trump. There's even still a lot of people who wouldn't vote if they were paid, although we may see some of them vote thanks to the universal vote-by-mail initiatives. And now we have a growing group of people who are reconsidering their support for Joe Biden, especially among certain voting blocs. See, Joe Biden is known as a gaff king. Misspeaking is a part of his supposed charm. Since the beginning of the primary season, though, his gaffes seem to be accelerating and becoming more egregious. It's become bad enough that people are questioning if he's gone senile. His latest gaffe was to claim that African Americans who didn't plan to vote for him, quote, ain't black, unquote. Jesus, Joe, that isn't a gaffe. That's a statement even more idiotic than Hillary's basket of deplorables comment. Joe's also got a problem with the Trump impeachment investigation. Namely, it's become known that Biden and Obama both actually knew exactly what was going on with this investigation before the inauguration in 2017. Now, I'm not aware of any particular law on interfering with the inauguration of an incoming president. Having said that, I am aware of 18 U.S.C. 595. That section specifically prohibits administrative government employees from using official authority to interfere with the nomination or election of any candidate. The penalty for this is up to a year in prison. The investigation of Michael Flynn, a member of Trump's campaign, would fall under the purview of this law. This was the law cited by the impeachment when Trump requested the investigation of Joe Biden's activities in the Ukraine, by the way. I am also aware of 18 U.S.C. 600, which prohibits making any offer of employment or other benefits authorized by an act of Congress for support of or opposition to a candidate. Jesus, Joe. You can't use any government resources to actively interfere, and you have a duty to report any such activities. Joe has yet another problem with influence peddling. 18 U.S.C. 208 specifically prohibits the use of public office for private gain. Yet we now have a transcript of a series of phone calls between the then-VP Biden and then-Ukrainian President Poroshenko in which a billion dollars in loan guarantees to the Ukraine were seemingly exchanged for the termination of a certain Ukrainian prosecutor, who at the time was investigating a company named Burisma Holdings. Burisma happens to have a member of the board of directors named Hunter Biden. If the connection to the Burisma Holdings investigation can be established firmly, Biden is potentially in violation of 18 U.S.C. 208, using public office for private gain. Biden's also been named a criminal suspect by a Ukrainian court in the same investigation which may return charges of high treason against Poroshenko. Jesus, Joe. Just because it's your son who benefited most doesn't mean that it's not your private gain. And these taped conversations look really, really bad for you and for the U.S. Of course, there's still the whole Tara Reid allegation, which has now been partially corroborated by associates of Reid. Naturally, most of the media is focused on discrediting Reid instead of finding further evidence either for or against Biden. Even prominent feminists are backtracking from their positions, claiming that they never advocated believing all women, just believing women. I guess that makes sense to them. Reed's entire career as a victim's advocate is now being called into question because of her allegation, too. Jesus, Joe, you may be outside the statute of limitations for a criminal investigation, but there is no statute of limitations in the court of public opinion, and you know it. Any one of these problems is devastating and could cost Joe Biden the election. Taken together, such problems would ruin most campaigns outright. In Biden's case, they effectively leave his campaign with Joe Biden. He's not Trump, as a primary campaign position. Not very promising. We saw this before in past elections. 
no candidate for president is going to win an election if they don't inspire confidence in them. No candidate can win just because they aren't the other candidate either. If Biden runs on not being Trump, then the entire election is about Trump, not Biden. So long as Trump shows some success, Trump wins. And so long as Trump is doing what needs to be done to handle the crisis, Trump isn't going to be blamed by most people for the negative impacts of COVID-19. There's been an attempt to blame Trump for the outbreak, for the lockdowns, for the collapse of the economy, for hyping untested treatments, and for everything else in general. The problem with that is that people in the United States largely blame China for the outbreak, approve of the lockdowns as temporary measures only, blame the ongoing collapse of the economy on the virus, see the unproven treatments getting tested and approved, and generally see Trump actively doing what needs to be done to control the outbreak, to support the state responses, to get the economy going again, and to keep the country focused on what they can do to help each other. They blame the failures of those responses on the governors, the partisan politics on Congress, and the ongoing economic collapse on not ending temporary measures soon enough. In short, Trump looks like he's handling the crisis, so much so that the media outlets are focused on mocking what he says and playing up any sign of dissent in the COVID task force as him ignoring expert advice, while refusing to cover his daily press briefings. There's a firestorm on social media about COVID, Biden, and the lockdowns. China is actively resisting the general dialogue that they are responsible for the delayed responses to the virus globally, but that propaganda is largely falling on deaf ears. Countries like Australia are rallying together to demand a full, fair, and impartial investigation of the pandemic, some with an eye towards demanding reparations from whomever's responsible. Biden is getting a lot of support in social media from a cavalcade of apologists, many of whom have no response to legitimate concerns about Biden beyond orange man bad. And as for the lockdowns, there's a debate now about whether the Tenth Amendment authorizes the states to interfere with speech, the press, assembly, redress of grievances, and religion. I've been studying the Constitution for decades now. The Supreme Court has ruled that the government at any level can infringe on First Amendment rights only if necessary, but any interference must be limited, minimize harm, and apply to everyone, not specific groups. No limit on peaceful assembly can exceed the bare minimum necessary to prevent harm. So while lockdowns are permitted under the Constitution, they must only apply so long as they prevent more harm than they cause. That standard applies to all of the First Amendment rights, including political protesting. Sorry, Governor Whitmer, those protests you've been so adamant are unlawful are actually protected, so long as they pose no threat to public health and safety, which social distancing and masking in the protests is mitigating anyway, then protesters have a right to wave signs and chant. Businesses have a right to earn what they can within the limits of any lockdown because every business is essential to someone. Now, I'm not advocating for hairstylists who are sick going back to work cutting hair and infecting dozens of people. But I am pointing out that telling a small business owner that she can't even conduct online transactions because the state deems her business non-essential is wrong. Without online selling, more businesses will go bankrupt and the economic crisis will both expand in scope and extend in duration as a result. Attorney General Barr ordered the Department of Justice to look for and investigate civil rights violations back on April 27. By that time, the DOJ had already been investigating allegations of price gouging and other attempts to unfairly profit from the crisis. Trump has made it clear from the start that maintaining protective measures was to last only as long as necessary. The president also made it clear that keeping businesses solvent was just as important as controlling the outbreak. Why aren't governors listening? The government cannot borrow money to pay people to stay home forever. For that matter, the government cannot and should not appropriate any money for their pet projects, no matter how much leverage Congress thinks that it has to force through radical policy changes. And as for the rights of people, the patience of Americans is limited regarding how long they will abide being stuck at home, unable to work, and steadily losing their life savings. This isn't just a constitutional issue, either. The lockdowns and economic uncertainty have already triggered a rise in suicide rates globally. 
we may have already passed the point at which stay-at-home orders and forced business closures will cause more deaths in America than the virus. People who have conditions like cancer are particularly vulnerable to COVID, but they also need access to cancer treatments which they cannot get right now, or their existing health conditions will prove just as fatal as COVID-19 might be to them. Health and safety demand that the world use the protective measures already in place, like social distancing and masking, to foster reopening the economies of every country whose outbreak is under control. Not all at once, mind you, and only in a manner which avoids letting a second wave overwhelm us, but starting right away. We cannot wait for a vaccine to start restoring jobs and access to services. But those opinions and the facts which inform them largely fall on deaf ears, it seems. At least as far as there's an election and a Green New Deal at stake. Wake up. It's time to move forward, not cower in a corner hoping that the boogeyman doesn't find us. We need to get back to the business of living.